What is going on, everybody? I'm Jeff St. Pierre, and this is episode 114 of the Adult Education Podcast. This week, I'm speaking with author Grady Hendricks. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. I really do appreciate you taking some time out of your day to listen to adult education. This show is all about learning some new things or maybe expanding your knowledge on some topics that you're already familiar with. I like to speak with experts across all fields to learn more about health, education, mental health, music, technology, and really just about anything. If you'd like to support adult education, the best way to do that is to leave a five-star rating on whatever platform you're listening on. And if you like what you hear, please share it with your friends. Word of mouth is the best way to bring in some new people to check out the show. So a while back, I was listening to another podcast and I heard the host discussing their reading habits. She said for a long time, she had felt like she wasn't allowed to read fiction. She thought that since she was an adult, that she should only be reading nonfiction and educational books to continue learning and expanding her knowledge, which I think some people do go through. But one day she said uh, she had an epiphany and she just thought, who cares what you read? Like, is there anybody looking over your shoulder and keeping tabs on what books you're reading? The important thing is that you're reading. So she dove back into fiction. I remember having a very similar feeling about fiction versus nonfiction. So I started reading more fiction novels again when I heard her story. I was like, you know what? You're right. I don't have to apologize for liking a good story. It's been so much fun. And one of the authors that I've really enjoyed reading is Grady Hendrix. He's uh, actually my guest this week. It's a return visit for Grady. I spoke with him a while back when he released the book, The Final Girls Support Group. Since then, I've done a deep dive into the rest of his catalog. At the time I'm recording this podcast, I've read four of his books, and I just started a fifth. Uh, one of those that I read is his latest. It's his book called How to Sell a Haunted House. Just came out, just hit bookstores. It's a story about a brother and sister that have to come together after the tragic death of their parents. Their relationship is put to the test as they work to clean out their parents' home, and they discover there's a lot more going on in the house than they really remembered. It's a very interesting book. I love it, and we talk a lot about it in this conversation. Uh, Grady, really interesting guy and a pleasure to talk to. We took a turn in this conversation to discuss a little more about his writing process and what he really likes to focus on when he's putting a book together. And I'm always fascinated by how authors put all their thoughts together for a story. I, I guess I'm a little jealous because I just can't do it. I just don't have the mindset of an author to pull that together. Now, before we dive into our conversation, you may notice some outside noises and a little voice popping up during our chat. My two-year-old daughter decided she did not want to take a nap when we recorded the interview. So she was uh, sitting on my lap the whole time, basically trying to grab anything on my desk that she could get her hands on, trying to hit all the buttons on my computer and the soundboard. All in all, I, I was pretty thankful she was as calm as she was, but there are some moments you'll hear you know, some noises in the background. And Grady, if you happen to be listening to this podcast right now, I do apologize for the distraction. I'm looking forward to our next chat when I can be fully 110% engaged in what's going on and not worrying about a toddler sitting on my lap. Anyway, thank you for listening, and here's my conversation with Grady Hendricks. How are you? Good, good. Can you hear me okay? I can. I'm sorry for being a minute or two late here. No worries. My daughter has uh, been on a new schedule the last few weeks. She went to preschool now, so we're uh, <clears throat> we're still feeling out nap time and how that's going to work for us. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So if you see a tiny uh, head popping up behind me, it's not a puppet chasing after me in a haunted house, but it is my daughter that wants to know what we're doing right now. <laughs> well, I don't know. I wouldn't be so sure about the puppet. <laughs> I will say I'm never going to let her have puppets after reading your book. Well, I think that's sort of wise. Um, I feel like, why would you ever? Yeah, right. I mean, oh, my gosh. Although I have I have run into a bunch of people on this tour who uh, whose parents got them uh, dolls designed to look like them when they were children, which I think is pretty abusive. That's that's a thing too. Like my sister had one and it's kind of like along the uh, American girl doll situation. Like she had one that was designed like her. And my wife was talking about having one designed like our daughter. And I was like, I don't want to do that to her. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I will follow up with you talking about meeting people on this tour and hearing about them having dolls designed like them. I found reading your book, you were describing the home and describing the relationship between the two main characters, uh, Louise and Mark. It, is so close and so identical to the way my dad and his sister de dealt with the death of their parents. And the description of right. the home was so identical to their home that it became too real for me. <laughs> like there were moments reading the book where you're describing things and I'm like, I know exactly at what point in the house he's standing. I know exactly where that chair is laying. Like I could picture the whole thing because it just, it, it felt like you were describing my family in so many ways. 
Oh, well, you know, it's interesting with writing. There's a thing, it's a little bit like a cold reading, I think. And um, when mediums do that, you know, they they do they pick up on those cues from people. Um, for me, I feel like one, if I get a place and a, and a setting and a, and a story, and it feels really real to me. And I really get into those details and get those specifics nailed down really hard. It's going to resonate with other people. And whether it's um, like in your case, you're talking about your your dad and his sister. But it's like if it was slightly different, it might have a different association with you. You know what I mean? A different set of relatives or something like that. I just feel like the more specific and detailed I make it in relation to me, the more of that seems to work for other people. Um, so it, it's a strange thing. I don't quite understand how that works, but it seems to work. I mean, even the moment where you were talking about the cleaning crew coming to take care of the things at the house after the parents' death, when my grandfather passed away, I went with my dad to go check. Oh yeah, we'll get to that in a second, honey. I went with my dad to check out the house and my aunt had ordered someone to come with a dumpster to come clean out the house. And we show up and we're like, wait a second, we want to you know, clean this out and, and make sure we're not throwing anything valuable away. We want to make sure we take the things that mean something to us. I mean, you were literally describing the situation minus the creepy dolls. You were describing the situation that I lived through. And it was so wild to read that in a book from somebody else's completely random perspective. Yeah. Well, it's weird, right? I, it's just, it's one of those things where this is so specific to me, that to hear other people, it resonates with them is, is a wild, weird feeling. I, uh, I found something at the beginning of the book. I, I don't know if it was the introduction or where it was, but you said you were writing this for the ghosts or it was the book was for the ghosts. Do you feel like in a way that you're writing for them? Well, only in the sense that I feel like, you know, it's funny. There's fictional ghosts and there's real ghosts and people who have and, and fictional ghosts are a lot of fun, right? You got the, the girl in the ring and all those, you know, girls in white dresses with long black hair who are wet. Um, you've got, you know, all the killer ghosts and all that. But in real life, I feel like um, lots and lots and lots of people feel like they've had some kind of encounter with the ghost. Sure. And I feel like yeah, I sort of want to lean into that with this book. I mean, I know this book is about haunted puppets and dolls, but there are these feelings of um, that overlap where memory and dreams and some kind of out, you know, supernatural experience all kind of overlap. And that's what I was trying to sort of get at with this. You know, it's funny. Um, I was talking to someone who's like very cynical about this stuff and doesn't believe in any of it. And I was talking about that feeling I used to get, or I, and I think a lot of people get, where you come home from school and you're at home and no one else is there. And there's this real overwhelming feeling of being in your house by yourself and that all the rooms aren't, they don't feel empty. And they totally got that experience. But to them, they'd never gone that extra step and really examined it you know to them it was like feeling creepy and they never really thought about well why do you feel creepy well you feel creepy because you feel like you're not alone like well what would it be that you're not alone with you know mm -hmm. yeah and the book primarily takes place I, I think south carolina is that where it takes place yeah, South Carolina. Yeah, and you know, in the South, if if you go there, if people listening have ever been there, there's a lot of like ghost tours in a lot of these major cities, and and you have a lot of families that live on the same block, on the same street. There's so much history. There's so much going on there, and you touch on that with this story as well, where there's history in this home, where the family has had things happen there over the decades that they've been a part of this property and this land, and that's so prevalent in the South of this country in general because so many families stay close together and they live in the homes when their parents pass away and these things are handed down through generations so that also really rang true I felt because you feel you feel the stories you feel the stories over time that you right. would hear from family passing down it's funny uh you know someone was asking about southern gothic and um I was saying well I think one of the things is in the south people really value storytelling you know people are always telling stories and 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 you know, it's a part of the country defined by those stories in a way New England isn't. And it, it's defined by that both better and for worse. You know, um, I mean, after the Civil War, the South had to tell an entire story about what they were and who they were um, so that they could escape the, the, the being branded as traitors. Before the Civil War, you know, the South had to tell this long story about um, why they were different and unique from other parts of the country. Uh, and even when, you know, this country was settled, and this is something that happened everywhere, but I feel like a little more in the South than in the Northeast, because New England was largely settled by uh, people with, for religious reasons. 
And in the South, it was largely settled by a hodgepodge of people for business reasons and all kinds of other reasons. Um, but they wanted to tell a story about, you know, triumph and all that stuff. And uh, and so I think the South is just sort of found it. I mean, it's 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 a fictional region, you know? I mean, there is no, you know, is Kentucky the South? Is it not? What about Texas? What about Florida? You know, it's a fictional area. Um, there's no legally defined or politically defined South. And so I think in families also, there's a lot of talk of stories, you know, stories about relatives and ancestors and all that stuff. And so I think, and and family stories are often gothic because they deal with birth and death and sickness and, you know, suicide and alcoholism and all those things that, that are part and parcel of family life. And, um, and I think those are the things that feel gothic to us. We don't, we don't talk about those things a whole lot um, outside the context of horror. You know, it's, it's hard to find anyone talking about death outside the context of horror in pop culture. You know, there's a few people, but like, it, it doesn't happen very often. So I feel like Southern Gothic sort of is like, well, yes, but it's kind of, I don't think it's because the South is spooky. I just think it's because people from the South can't shut up. <laughs> and you know what? I just went back through some of your catalog after uh, reading How to Sell a Haunted House. I was kind of reinvigorated. And I was like, you know what? I know there's other books I haven't read yet. Um, and I went and read a, a Southern Book Club's Guide to Vampire Hunting. Is that, am I saying it right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think you just nailed that too. I mean, you've got reading the entire book and going through that, just the way the characters never stop talking and just always have something to say. And there's always an opinion. There's always a feeling as soon as you said they just never shut up like i mean that's exactly how that book was written yeah exactly well and you know it's funny like i i love writing action but i like talking more i like dialogue more i often had to kick myself to, to make my characters do something rather than just talking endlessly because that's also my experience in real life like i mean good lord in in new york I mean, for a long part of your life, the number one activity is going to brunch on Sundays or going out for breakfast. Well, you just go somewhere, but then you talk for hours. You know, nothing much happens, but a lot of talking does. So I feel like um, talk is really... Um, underrated, I think, is a is a tool. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. And, you know, I've been watching that show. I don't know if you've caught it yet, the new show on HBO Max, The Last of Us. Um, and I Oh, think, yeah, I've heard I, I can't wait to check it out, yeah. What, what I find so fascinating about it is kind of what I found fascinating about The Walking Dead when that first came out is that, yeah, there's this, you know, evil zombie creature or whatever out there. But at the same time, you're watching a show about the human condition. So it doesn't even need to be right. a ton of action. You're watching how humans are. And just the way you describe your writing, I feel very similarly about that. Like I'm learning more about these humans and their lives and their interactions with others and how that's led them to where they are and how that's going to lead them to their future. And I think that's so fascinating. I love, I love the human condition more than I like the action sometimes. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think one thing a lot of these apocalypse shows are doing, especially stuff like The Walking Dead and The Last of Us, and 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 there's a lot of other ones, but everyone you run into in these shows has this story. Where were you when the zombies appeared? You know, where were you when the world ended? And how did you get from there to here? And what kind of life are you living now to survive? And I think those shows um, put that in this sort of genre framework, right? This is the end of the world, and I need to know about this person in order to survive. But in real life, that's that's just something we choose not to pay attention to. You know, your car, you know, breaks down, and you need to. I don't know. Well, I guess now with cell phones, you don't really have to call for help or anything. But your car breaks down, and someone stops to help you. Well, that person, how'd they get there? Where were they going? What, are they, what kind of life are they leading? All those things that within the context of like a, a apocalypse show like Last of Us suddenly take on this real genre intensity. They already exist with people, often with the same intensity. We're just not cued to look at it because this is real life, quote unquote, normal life, normal day-to-day -day behavior. And we kind of normalize this really insane world we walk through every day. So uh, I think in the book too, at the beginning, you say that you started writing this book, I think it was 10 years ago, and you weren't sure this was ever going to come to light. So tell me more about that process. Oh, well, that was Southern Book Club. Yeah, oh, that yeah, was Southern um, Book Club. I'm sorry. I missed, yeah, yeah. I, I confused no, no, the no, no, I read no, no, them back worry. to back and I think I confused them on a couple of things. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Don't worry. Yeah, Southern Book Club was the one that just stated for a lot longer. This one was, How to Sell a Haunted House was hard because- Around the time I did my best friend's exorcism, my sister-in-law 
pointed out that all my characters were only children. Mm -hmm. And that in a lot of books that she and her daughter, who read a lot of YA, read, they're often only children. And it's because families are hard and authors are lazy and I'm, I'm no exception. Um, it's hard to do a family because families are 100% or families are 98% backstory. And so I, I've said this to someone before, but like, I think we've all had this experience where you're dating someone or you're married to someone or you're involved with someone and you go to their family's house for dinner and you leave and you're like, well, that was, that was nice. And they're like, are you kidding me? Could you believe what my brother said? Could you believe what my dad was doing? Like, and it's all this backstory that you don't have any, any insight into, you know, every family is like a planet and everyone speaks the same language and has the same culture. And, and as that family dies out or not, you know, as the parents pass away, if you have a, if you lose a sibling or something, you're losing members of this race that speaks this particular, that knows these references, that has these these connections. And I think that's one of the reasons why losing a sibling, not not just to death, but just, you know, severing your your connection with a sibling is so hard and emotionally fraught. It's like it's like you're Superman. You're the last survivor of this dying planet. And here's someone else who who speaks Kryptonese and you know they know Krypton culture and you're like and I'm never going to speak to you again. You know, like, like you're choosing isolation, which is, which is, I'm not saying is always a bad choice. Sometimes you have to do that, but it, it makes it really, really hard. Um, and so for this, it was really hard to write a family. Like I had to understand the joiners in a way, like I understand my own family, which is, um, took a lot of work and a lot of work that's not on the page. I mean, there's so much stuff that's not on the page, but I don't think what's on the page works if you don't, have that background. Yeah, no, it's funny. It's funny how a conversation can change the way you feel about something. And I'm, you know, talking to you right now about this. And I think that's what captivated me so much about this story, how to sell a haunted house was, was the family and was the way you dove into it and was the way you talked about their background, their history, how they interact with each other. And even the way, you know, Louise's uh, not husband, but her uh, baby daddy, if you will, the father of oh, her Ian, child, yeah. the way he doesn't see things the same way that she does in the family. And even yeah. the aunts and the, everybody that they talk to, like even they don't necessarily see some of the same interactions. Like it, it's so interesting now to hear your perspective speaking to you. And I think that's, that's really what drew me to this book even more. There's some great, you know, horror elements to it. There's some great spooky elements that keep you on the edge of your seat, but it is the dynamics that are what really kept me reading this book and holding me in. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. And, you know, it's funny, like, um, one of the things I always like to try to do with my books is I want people to think they know these characters and have these characters be more than you're expecting. Um, because that's by my experience in life. Like I've always had relatives who I thought I had pegged and then I find out something about their lives that completely rewrites that. You know, I think we often we often develop the lazy version of people we meet, you know, oh, this guy, he's X, Y, and Z. And that doesn't let them, you know, be someone else. And I think that's really, um, I think that's a real trap we fall into or I fall into on a regular basis. So I'm always trying to do that in my books where you think this person is X and they turn out to be Y. Yeah, I feel like I had a similar feeling after Final Girls Support Group, which was the first book of yours that I read and kind of how I got introduced uh, to your writing. Uh, because of the way you wrote it, you were writing it based on characters that we knew so well from film that I felt drawn in already. And I think I said to you when I spoke to you about it that right from the beginning of that book, I'm into it. Like, because I already I already know some of the backstory, like just inherently from right. seeing the movies and knowing about these characters they were based off of. I was like, man, I'm in. I'm all in from page one, just from this right. book right here. So I, I think that human condition, that writing of who these people are, that really is your specialty here. Oh, thanks. No, I appreciate it. Well, Final Girl Support Group was good because I was lucky in a way. Like, like you said, we already know these people, you know, and so then I didn't have to set up expectations to defy them. I, you had the expectations going in. So that made my job not easy, but but much more fun. <laughs> when we spoke last about that, I believe the book had been optioned to Charlize Theron and a production company or something. Yeah. How are we doing on that? Is that still in the works or? Yes, yeah, still in the works. Um, and it is uh, Andy Machete, who did the It movies and the upcoming Flash wow. movie, is directing it, the pilot, um, with Barbara Machete, his sister. And um, we've got a showrunner. We've got a pilot script. They're just uh, banging banging that with hammers right now, trying to get in shape to to get a green light to shoot. 
Uh, what a difference a couple years makes too, huh? I mean, and my best friend's exorcism also came out on Amazon a little while ago, which I didn't realize yeah. at first was yours until diving back into your catalog. I was like, oh my gosh, I just watched that movie. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and that's one that I had almost nothing to do with. It's sort of a, the first thing I ever had optioned. And uh, the deal happened. And three years later, I heard from them, oh, the movie's done. I was like, what? <laughs> OK. Um, so that was very much like sending your kid off to college and they they do a crappy job of staying in touch. And then they come home and you're like, wow, OK, look, look at those piercings. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I love how that works is I'll talk to authors uh, when they do their book tours. And there have been some folks like yourself that I've been lucky enough to speak to multiple times now. And, you know, you hear one time that something's been optioned and you speak to them again a couple years later and yeah, I got nothing for you. I guess. So it's so weird how that world works in that process. Yeah. Well, it's funny. You know, it's like it's feast or famine, right? Like, uh, you know, I'm really lucky in that people were interested in one property and then they're interested in another and another. Um, that doesn't always happen. And it happens in waves. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, it's a strange thing. It's also very weird. I mean, this is my, what is it? Sixth novel. I'm working on my seventh and I've got two nonfiction books too. And so it's just like, it's really nice to build up that back catalog and, and sort of, um, you know, I, I don't know what to do besides write books. Like, and for the last eight or nine years, just about, I would say eight years, all I've done is write books, which, which I enjoy. I like doing it, but that has become such, the writing of the books has become such an important part of my life in a way that I didn't anticipate that it's really strange. I mean, I spend 10 months of the year really involved with imaginary people, um, doing made up things and having a relationship with them. It's, it's very special. It's a very weird process. Yeah, I read somewhere when you were putting together How to Sell a Haunted House, you had a wall of crazy that you uh, put together. Oh, I always do. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm between walls of crazy right now because I'm moving offices, which is hard because I'm working on a book and I don't have my wall. But yeah, it's all my photo reference pinned up in front of me. I rented an office when I did Horror Store um, because A, I had a little extra money. B, office space in New York's expensive. And this made me... I had to generate enough money every month to sort of like pay for the office. So it kept me on my toes and see, you know, I lived in a one bedroom apartment with my wife and working from home seemed like a really good way to get a divorce. And so, um, so, and when I got there, I was like, Oh my God, I get my wall of crazy. Just like someone investigating the serial killer or a conspiracy. And one of the interesting things with it is sometimes an image will go up on it. And a lot of times it's photo reference, you know, clothes of the era or the, the part of the guy, you know, um, cars, things like that, um, schedules, television schedules, weather charts. Um, but a lot of times, um, lots of calendars, uh, but a lot of times there will be just random sort of inspirational images and they won't work for that book. And so they'll just sit there until the book they work on pops up. And so when I did, we sold our souls and I think like 2016, 2017, I put up an image on there. It was this black and white photo of this little kid wearing an old man mask with a beard walking up a flight of stairs. And it really resonated with me. And it sat there. It didn't have anything to do with that book. It didn't have anything to do with Southern Book Club. It didn't have anything to do with Final Girl Support Group. But for Haunted House, that was an image that was really pivotal for it. Um, and, and there's a couple of things plot-wise that happened that would not have happened if that image hadn't been sitting there sort of incepting me. And, um, and so you know, these things just stay and eventually they pop up. Uh, so that was a really nice part of the wall of crazy is something could sort of live with me until I needed it. So I've checked off how to sell a haunted house, final girls, uh, Southern book club. I've got horror store on hold right now at the library. Um, so I'm working my way through the catalog right now, which oh. has been very enjoyable. <laughs> I wouldn't mind. Sick of me. I wouldn't mind seeing a uh, sequel to Southern book club. I don't know the way that ended. I kind of felt like that was sort of open-ended there at the end. Well, you know, I didn't think of it as open-ended, but what was really interesting is that's been option for HBO, and I'm really involved with the writing process on it. And um, one of the things that always comes up when you're doing these things is people say, well, what's, what's, this, what's season two? And I mean, to me, that's a dumb question. Like, the, the story ends when the story ends. Nothing has to go on forever. Sure, yeah. But it made me start thinking, like, what is season two? And I realized that you know, James Harris is not the only thing like him out there. There's, I, in my mind, there's about 32 others. And um, they don't like each other. They keep their distance. But 
I had this idea of Corey, uh, Patricia's daughter, going off to college. And, you know, it would be the the 90s when there was that real, like, weird, the late 90s when there was that weird, like, sex positive thing going on where yeah. girls were expected to, like, go to strip clubs and be good sports and, like, you know, look important, even if they didn't want to. Uh, it was considered being, like, fun. And, um, and, you know, and I was like, oh, so what if she meets one of these other guys? Because, you know, she's got this addiction that she's fighting. And, and even if she lives, you know, and I think anyone who's had addiction issues will tell you, you're, you're never not an addict. Like, you know, you're just, you know, you're just not practicing your addiction, uh, you know, and so it's, uh, I thought that would be really good. Cool. So there may be with the television show a way to get more of that. Well, I'll be looking forward to seeing that. I felt like I was late to the Grady Hendrix party, but I'm so glad that I'm here because I've really been enjoying it. Well, the party, it goes all night. So latecomers are more than welcome. They they usually, we usually need booze around the time they show up. So well, I, I'd, lo- I'd love to bring some into the party here. So you guys have got some more, but, uh, but yeah, what a fantastic book, How to Sell a Haunted House. I really enjoyed it. And anybody listening right now that has not checked out your work, uh, seriously, just take a deep dive. There's so much fun in these good scares, good fun, good good human development. I just, uh, you, you're a great writer, Grady. That's what I'm getting at. Oh, thank you. This is, it's so nice to have my, my uh, ego pampered like this early in the morning. I really appreciate it. Tell your publicist <laughs> I did that. She asked me to boost your ego today. So please tell her that I said that. Oh, thank God. I hope they paid you extra. <laughs> well, Grady, I appreciate your time. Sorry for the interruptions here with my, uh, my little one, but, uh, but yeah, is there a place people can I go? I didn't even they, notice. Well, perfect. If there's there a place people can go, if they want to find out some more info about you. Yeah, uh, GradyHendrix.com. It's the link to all my social media stuff and, and where to get the books and more about the books. And and I I talk about dumb paperbacks on there, all kinds of stuff. So if you want more, I don't know why you would, that's the place to go, GradyHendrix.com. That's my last point. That's the other thing that I think changed. When I spoke to you around Final Girls, I was trying to find you on social media. And the only account I could really find was basically a paperback fan club account. And now I went to yeah. find you and your Instagram is like this massive presence on uh, social media. I was like, wow, good for Grady. I like to see this. I, I'm working hard. I'm working hard <laughs> doing the socials. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. I wish you the best of luck. And I, I can't wait to see what else is coming next from you. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Have a good one. All right. Take care. Bye. Big thank you to Grady Hendrix for his time. I truly look forward to our next time chatting. Uh, Hopefully, like I said before, that I won't have a little one sitting with me for that one. Check out Grady's latest book, How to Sell a Haunted House, available wherever you get your books. And also just go ahead and read the rest of them too because all of his books are fantastic. And thank you to all of you for checking out the Adult Education Podcast. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, be well.